What is going on, everybody? It is Triple Crown 24 back today doing a contest response for my friend Mike over at Baseball Collector who hit 5,000 subscribers on his channel. Huge congratulations, Mike. That's definitely not a milestone to uh, scoff at by any means. Uh, I think it's a testament to all your years of hard work producing content. So, again, props to you on that and congratulations, my friend. Want to address one elephant in the room, by the way. For anyone who doesn't listen to my podcast and doesn't see me wearing these glasses on there, uh, this is just to protect my eyes from the UV lights since I'm constantly working at the computer, making sure that my eyes, you know, stay healthy. So that's the reason I'm wearing glasses if you're not used to seeing me wearing them. It's only when I'm working at the office that I wear them. Uh, anyways, back to the topic at hand here, Mike's contest. He asked two questions for us to respond to, and I don't do as many contest responses. I always say that I'm going to do more, and then I end up not doing it. So I'm not going to say that today. No promises, but I, I will jump on them when I can. Why, why, why don't I put it out that way? Um, but Mike has two questions. He wants to know, what does YouTube mean to you in terms of the community, hobby, platform itself? And then who or what has influenced you via YouTube and kind of how they've done so. Wrote that down on here. It's my little cheat sheet. I really sort of forgot. Um, that's what I'm looking down. So I'm going to basically tell the story, I guess, of my YouTube tenure. And I think that will answer both questions at the same time because influence is really dictated a lot of the flow of my channel and the flow of, I guess, my hobby journey. So that is why I'm going to do it in such that in such that way. Uh, let's start from the beginning, shall we? Back long ago, even way before my channel is in its current incarnation, I think the first time I started making videos was back in 2014. And sorry, I don't go looking for them. They're gone. They have been wiped from the face of the earth. So unless you can somehow tap into the YouTube archives, uh, you won't be finding them. But way back then... It was a lot different, I feel. Uh, it was the community, if you will, was much smaller <laughs> back then. Uh, and the card related videos, there just there wasn't as much content out there as you see today. And it's definitely been a uh, if you want to look at it, it's it's been exponential growth in terms of the number of sports card or sports hobby related content that is out there. Uh, so back then I used to watch the OGs that you guys know of now. The big one that I used to watch was Top 85 401, my, my friend Nate. Uh, and then I watched the classics, of course. You know, your, your Chris Justice over at Cards Infinity, who's still going strong today. Used to do a lot of breaks with Chris back in the day. It's something that I can't really afford to do too much anymore. I've got my foot in too many different areas, but just a really solid dude who's, who's one of the OGs out there, kind of one of the pioneers of making a uh, youtube content so i used to watch him and, and a lot of other channels that have kind of come and gone people who have taken hiatuses and that was kind of my thing too is that i would make a few videos and then stop for six months make a few videos pick it back up and it wasn't until 2018 that i really stuck with it and when i initially got back into it i wasn't necessarily expecting to stick with it i thought it was going to be another fad uh, so taking you up to spring of 2018, I was kind of going through a bit of a transitional period in my life and I guess, uh, finding my way and kind of carving out my identity in, in some sense of the word. Uh, one of the things I was doing as, as a hobby at the time that I was really enjoying was collecting autographs via in person or in the mail or just purchasing autographs. And keep in mind, I'm a you know, being a college student and a grad student during my time of, of TTMing, I didn't really have the biggest budget for the hobby. So that was definitely a nice low cost way. You know, a stamp back then was 50 cents. So you send a stamp both ways. It's a dollar per TTM request unless there was some kind of fee attached to it. But even then, I never went after like any of the big time ones. And uh, back then, Really, the big TTM YouTube channels was the Autograph Network. Mike still does some content today. Um, TTM Troy, who does content today, still, and you know, he had 
some of the best production quality out there among all the TTMers. So he was one that I definitely looked up to a lot uh, doing the TTMs and then just kind of searching for anything I could because it, it felt like there wasn't a lot of, of them out there. Number one uh, was Mike O. He's very important for multiple reasons, but he's very important to the story. And I'll, I'll get more into that in a moment. Um, and I wanted to share my own successes. So when I first started doing it, I was actually terrified. Now I had made content before that content was still up back then. They're, those videos, like I said, they're gone now. But for the most part, I was so nervous because I didn't want anyone from like my personal life to know. I didn't want to even appear on camera for any reason. I just wanted to basically show up, show my TTMs and call it a day. I wasn't even planning on responding to the comments at the beginning. It was more so just to put my stuff out there so that I could share it with other people, kind of like it would be like a Twitter post or an Instagram post. And that would be it. Um, there wouldn't be much more to it than that. And as time kind of evolved, I realized that there was an actual community to get involved with. You know, before when I had made videos, it was just kind of a passing thing where maybe they got a couple of views and a couple of friends and some people that would comment and watch, but it wasn't really anything that was like it was today or like it was back in 2018 when I was pumping out videos often. So spring of 2018, I started to get involved. Um, I remember Mike O was watching a lot of his content outside of the TTM stuff because I would venture outside of it. And Mike did a lot of really cool things. You know, he opened up product. I like to open up products. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, he used to just show off cards from his Phillies collection that he would pick up. And I would do the same thing with my Tiger stuff. I wouldn't show it off, but I would get the same type of cards. I would read the comments and people were so supportive and they really enjoyed, um, you know, just how Mike approached the hobby. And I said, you know what? I can do this too. I'm going to put that out there. The first few times I did it, I didn't get too many views. Not too many people seemed to care. Uh, but as time went on and I put myself out there more and shared a bit more about myself and in turn, watch other people's videos and commented on them and learn more about them. That's when I, I started to, you know, really feel like I was a part of this community. So time goes on and I would say it's about a year later that I decided to gear my collection towards something else. I'm kind of burned out on the autograph game. I had gone to, uh, I had done a lot of TTM and I felt that I was in the point where I was just kind of sending out things for the sake of sending them out. It wasn't very much so for enjoyment. Uh, I didn't really like autographs or asking for autographs. I was also trying to pursue a career in sports and I felt like it was kind of weird to be, you know, I'd, in theory, working with these athletes, and then at the same time, I'm, I'm the, the geek asking for the autographs. Not that, not that it's a geeky thing, but just it's just, it's one of those things where you, you gotta. It would be difficult to s separate professional from personal life. I would feel to do all that. Uh, so I kind of stopped doing that. And what I found was that I started to figure out what I wanted to collect, and I dabbled in a few things. And one of the things that I caught on to was super collecting, uh, specifically my favorite player, Miguel Cabrera. So I started building up cards of his. I remember I got my first Super Fractor. I showed off a uh, patch auto that I had gotten, a really cool booklet auto that I had picked up. And it would mostly just be these like big cards that I would show off. And then I kind of got into that idea of super collecting where I wanted to get all the different ones because I was so used to just putting, like I would open up a pack and pull one of his cards out and just set it aside in a binder or something like that. Uh, but I started to think about it more. And I, again, I mentioned Nate Tops 85401's channel earlier on. And I just kind of thought about it in the context of, you know, how he was doing it. You know, he was making videos about his Bond stuff way back in the day when I first started making videos. And he was still doing it. And I thought, man, that's uh, it seems like that's something that I could really stick behind for a long time. And I had met several other uh, player collectors and super collectors through that as well. Uh, I'd be doing a disservice to not talk about the super collectors group over on Facebook uh, that is run by Dustin of Dustin and Blake. And he himself is a Kirby Puckett super collector. And I got, um, you know, he got me more into it. And then 
just various guys within that community who I engage with. Uh, one of the big ones and a, a very good friend of mine, even to this day, is Eric over at Oakland A's 915. And man, we text about cards like it seemed like every day back in like 2019 uh, of like cards for our super collection. We had like a bunch of running jokes and stuff. So he was a huge influence on me. And then he really shaped it later on when I started to decide to go more towards the quality stuff rather than the quantity. Uh, so that was a really big part of it. This kind of all culminates at the national in 2019. It was my first time going, uh, it was in Chicago and I ended up spending the most I'd ever spent on a single card. It was $650 for a 2000 tops traded, uh, Miguel Cabrera autograph. And it was a big time purchase for me at the time. I was there with, uh, Mark from, uh, Stope sports, uh, or whatever he's going by now. It's, sometimes it's Stove, sometimes it's Stove Collectors, and you know he's got all the different names, but we'll just call him Stove. Why not? Uh, Eric, those back pages was there too, and Andy, she bought me for Fractors. They were all right there when I was over in the red carpet area making this deal. So there I go, spending most of my budget before the show even technically opens on Wednesday night. Uh, but it was one of those cards where it was just so incredibly special and just getting to share it with everyone that whole weekend. You know, I went out to dinner that night with, with some of those guys. And then uh, Mike was hosting this contest, baseball collector. We, we went out to dinner with him and uh, Abel in Vegas uh, was also there with us too. And just kind of shooting the bull with the guys. And it was, it's what I really felt like, okay, this is, you know, this community, this has become a big part of my life. It, it had been, you know, building for that year up to that point, but it really hadn't hit me at this time. And, and and by the way, as I'm going through this timeline here, I'm not trying to leave anybody out. I'm not trying to exclude anyone uh, because there's just, I've been on YouTube, like doing this like full time for like four years now. So inevitably I'm, I'm going to miss a few names because that's a pretty long time in YouTube terms. So I do apologize if I miss any names, but just know that anyone who I've interacted with, regardless of how many times it was or what the extent of it was, you did influence me. I just want to make sure that that is stated for the record there. Um, but I kind of come back from the national after a meeting, you know, you get to, you know, these people from YouTube and then you kind of get to meet them. And, uh, really that summer was a weird time for me because I was kind of just trying to carve out my career and, I'm very thankful that things worked out the way they did. Um, I started getting enamored with the idea of setting up a card show to get kind of get rid of some of my excess. Talking with guys like Filmington, who was definitely a huge influence. I know that he would set up a lot. And I always loved uh, kind of this idea of a revolving collection, as I would call it, where, you know, you would get this inventory, some of the stuff he was interested in for himself but it was available for the right price, right? You know, he could kind of fund his own hobby through this buying and selling act. And that really intrigued me. So I was interested in setting up a show. I got an offer one day to set up that one. Uh, it would be Thanksgiving weekend of 2019. And kind of leading up to that, I had been acquiring some inventory and really shaping how I was going to go about things. I kind of decided, okay, this is what I'm actually going to stick to. And these are the little side projects that have started that I'm going to abandon because, you know, I, I need to kind of pick and choose and be more specific. So eventually it evolved in just keeping Cabrera stuff and the rest of it would be quote unquote inventory. So uh, it's, I'm going to say this next part and it's going to sound like I took it straight from a movie script, but this is truthfully how it went down. One Friday night, it was actually game six of the ALCS between the Yankees and the Astros. I remember very clearly uh, sitting down, getting ready to watch the game. Scrolling on Facebook, I see this post advertising a table that was available at a show in a suburb of Lansing, Michigan, which pull on my Michigan map here. It's like right in the center up there. It's like a four and a half hour drive from where I'm at. Uh, I've been preparing to set up for this show that's now about a month to a month and a half away. And I say, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And again, that was one of those things I was influenced by uh, someone like Phil and then some various YouTube channels. 
um, that I can't even remember because it was just me clicking on their videos one time talking about their first experience setting up at a show. So I decide that I'm going to go for it. I pack up my car in about 30 minutes, book a hotel room. I'm on my way up there. I'm, I'm listening actually to the Chicago AM uh, ESPN radio station, listening to the game uh, in the ALCS between these two teams as I'm driving up there. So I get there the next morning, just take care of business. And within the first 20 minutes of being set up, I had a sale for about $500. And then a few other dealers had come over and it was about $1,000 up before the first hour of the show was even over. And I kind of thought to myself, you know what, this is something that I could potentially make work. So I started putting out the card show recap videos and kind of talking about them. And they had a lot of good feedback and people were interested in the cards that I was picking up. People wanted to buy the cards I was picking up. And I'm like, you know, this is something that maybe I want to share a little bit more on. I'm just take people along with that with this journey. And those videos are still up too. If you want to go back and watch them, you can uh, go see all my past card show recaps. It's kind of cool to see, uh, I guess, how I thought of things back then. It was definitely a much different time in the hobby uh, compared to now, even just looking back myself. But as time goes on, I, I kind of decide that, you know what, I'm, I think I'm going to go for this. I think I'm going to go for this. And then that big show here locally happens. It was a huge success. And I said, you know what, this is exactly what I'm going to do. So the very next Monday morning, I decided, you know what, I'm not going to be applying for any more of these jobs. I am. This is this is my job now. I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to build an eBay store. I'm going to keep going to these shows. And I would start traveling at all these shows. And it was a lot of fun. I met a lot of great people got to stay with them, uh, you know, let me into their homes for free to stay with them, which was a huge help, especially starting off. I only had at that point. I probably only had a couple hundred dollars to my name. Uh, and it was, you know, I, I don't come from a very rich background. In fact, I come from, I'm, I'm very much so self-made. Uh, I you know, went to college on a financial needs scholarship, if that tells you, um, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to go. So, and why I said I was thankful for the way that things turned out is because, of course, we have the pandemic that happens, um, which really changed a lot because I felt like the community kind of shifted. You know, YouTube, it's difficult to constantly be wanting to put out content. And I thought that it would make us put out more content and we kind of grow closer. But uh, just, you know, some friends, you see them come and go from YouTube, they, they change interests or they want to step away from the hobby. That's, just some of that happens uh, with the hobby. But I was extremely worried at the time just with all the uncertainty, especially with you know, people being out of work and that kind of stuff, uh, and people being sick and prices of things going up or in some cases they went down. Uh, what would happen to you know people's hobby budgets? Would they be interested in buying cards? Well, little did I know that there would be a huge boom that resulted because of it. Uh, but at the time, there was a lot of uncertainty. So I was really, you know, studying YouTube videos and really trying to figure things out. And I remember back then, uh, one of the conversations I had with Mike O was, you know, he was pretty busy with a lot of things. And he asked me if I would want to take the reins on his PSA submission group, which I had done some grading here and there myself. I had shown a few of my reveals on the channel. I thought it would be something that would be beneficial for me. Um, he kind of took over the group submissions with SGC. I would do PSA. It was kind of our plan. So we, we rebranded the Facebook group that we had to Triple Crown 24 and my ghost grading submissions. And it is to this date one of the best decisions I have ever made, not just because I was able to help grow my business through it, but also because I made a lot of great connections. And it, it was really surreal for me, too. You know, Mike was, was someone who I definitely looked up to and still look up to, as well as. Uh, I guess the leader within the community and a, and a role model for, you know, just how he carries himself. And I, I, there's a lot of great things I could say about Mike O. And if he's watching this, you know, I, I truly do thank you for all your friendship and mentorship over the years. But it was really surreal for me to be like, all of a sudden I'm working aside Mike O uh, with this grading group. And it, it was so cool. And, you know, getting to connect with people even more uh, through that, you know, Getting, I guess, developing deeper connections with people I already knew and then making new friends 
uh, through this process as well. Some of which are here on YouTube, some of which just watch the channel and I know who they are and I greatly appreciate them for that. So that was something that I definitely got out of it. Um, on top of that, you know, people loved watching the reveals and then the group submissions. So it was good uh, publicity, I guess, for my uh, my platform. And that really, I think, marked the huge turning point for how I started to gear my channel. You know, initially, like I said, it was something to just show off my autograph collection. And then uh, I would just go about the wayside. And then I, I wanted people to know a bit more about what I collected and the stories behind it and my favorite players and all that. So it kind of became my place to share that. Um, and as time has gone on, it then became more of a hybrid. I, I'd give people an insight into my personal hobby and then kind of this business that I was growing as well. You know, this, I guess you could call it this Triple Crown 24 brand. And that was a big part of it was just kind of developing said brand and really starting to branch it out more and more um, and see where I could take it. And the, the YouTube channel was kind of like my central hub for that to kind of give people an insight and also to, I guess, document my growth on camera. So that was a big part of it um, and kind of what the platform started to mean to me as time went on. So we go throughout 2020, it's really more of the same. and. I would say things were very consistent for a long, long time there. You know, friends came and gone and that kind of stuff. You meet new people all the time. The channel just had pretty steady growth. It's it's slowed down definitely in the past year to, to two years, I would say, but still some growth, which is always good. Just continuing to develop some really deep friendships with guys, guys who I talk to uh, every day and just they know who they are. Um, and you know, getting to appear on their channels and appear and, you know, they would appear on mine too and tackling all these different things. So then we come up, I guess, to the fall of 2021. So jumping quite a bit ahead in the timeline here, almost about a year and a half where things are kind of the same, uh, more or less. And one of the things that kind of changes for me is that I move into this new office that you see here. And I decide I'm going to take my business to the next level. It is time to grow. It is time to expand. I can't just be working out of my spare bedroom all the time. So I start to grow this office. And a couple months into this, I made a huge decision to stop my super collecting ways. So kind of my days as a collector were at least subsided. I don't like to say that I'm no longer a collector because really part of my strategy for inventory acquisition as a dealer is thinking in the mindset of a collector. And to, depending on the way you want to look at it, kind of the inventory that I've accumulated is me being, uh, you know, it is a collection to some extent. It just happens to be that's all available for sale. And I have to say that the process has not been as difficult in some sense as I thought it would be, but much more difficult in other senses. So what do I mean by that? Um, part of it was, you know, moving the, some of these cards and selling them. I made a whole video about it, like, you know, why I'd lost my passion for it. And part of it was just not being able to keep up with all the different parallels and all that, and really just not having the time to do it anymore. You know, I sit here all day and, and work through this stuff. Kind of the last thing I wanted to do was go home and try to, you know, do the same thing for myself. It's just too much of the same thing. And I could definitely sense that I was steering in the direction of burnout if I kept going towards it. It's, it was just, you know, imagine if you worked in a bakery all day and you kind of sampled some sweets here and there, and then you came home and had a big old dessert. That's kind of how I would equate it. Um, so I made a decision and I've kind of continued to, and I've really, haven't added anything to my collection per se uh, or really built any kind of collection here over the past few months, especially the start of the new year in 2022. Um, I would say that there's no cards that I really have regret selling to this point. Um, knowing who they've gone to has definitely been a big part of it and seeing a lot of those people out there. But Part of it to me, one of my biggest fears, I guess, was fearing how people would kind of view it. Um, there's definitely a, a bad rap that I think that a lot of dealers get or a lot of sellers get or flippers get out there. Uh, and I didn't want to put myself in that box where I was, you know, 
Triple Crown 24 is only a dealer. Triple Crown 24 is only a flipper. I definitely don't consider myself an investor type. Um, those of you who are familiar with, I guess, my Steelers style know that it's not really my my end game, so to speak. Do I hope that the cards I have appreciate in value? Yes, of course I do, but I wouldn't I wouldn't call them investments. There are different things that I would like to invest in if I were to choose to go that route. Regardless, I didn't want to put myself in that box, and I was afraid of how people would label me or perceive me, especially old friends. Uh, who I kind of, you know, we connected with because we were collectors. And I have to say that nobody has treated me any different. Um, it has definitely been a little, it has felt different in some sense, but I've been able to really just, I guess more so embrace being someone who adds to others' collections rather than adding to my own and learning what, makes them happy because that is kind of one of the goals of my uh of my selling um you know the, the tagline for triple crown 24 is elevate your hobby and the your part of it is you know elevating your hobby such as you know elevating yourself in the hobby so your collection your connections with people but also i think elevating the hobby is just the general hobby so the people who are in it and elevating them, pushing them up and encouraging them to continue to do what they do and just the overall state so that more people can enjoy it or the people who in it have a better quality of enjoyment uh, for the hobby in general. So that was one of the reasons that I kind of came up with that and just really getting to, to know things. That's why I started my podcast. And a big reason for that I've, I've been inspired by a lot of the different podcasts on YouTube and various platforms. You know, Maiko's Hobby Talk is one that I've listened to for years now. It's kind of crazy to think that. Um, I love Filmington's different shows that he's done, especially his one with Ed, Wes Griff, kind of just talking to him. Uh, my my good buddy Garrett Cardcutter does his, his Squared Circle uh, chat, which is a, a wrestling-based podcast. Um, with another good friend of mine, Mike at Canadian Cards, and those two just their banter. It was so much fun. Uh, and it is multiple, but there's numerous podcasts out there. Um, the Essential Credentials podcast is one that I really enjoyed and, and kind of their look at things. And then again, the subject of this video, Mike himself with his golden age of cardboard and kind of learning from him, Ty over at Breaker Culture and kind of seeing his style and you know, when, you, when you're constantly exposed to all these different podcasts, it and sometimes makes you want to go ahead and jump in. I've had some people tell me that they want to make their own show, and uh, it's so much fun. Uh, it's something that I've greatly enjoyed doing and taking my own approach. You know, it, it's called sports card psychology. I by no means have any kind of psychology expertise. Um, I took Psych 101 in college. That's about as far as it goes, and that doesn't really mean all that much. Uh, but it's just kind of like a catchy show name. It's more so just digging into the reasons why and understanding the psyche behind these collectors. I know I use some fancy terms sometimes in the episodes, but uh, part, a big part of it is just learning why people do things and, and creating a better understanding. And I think that's really what my channel has now become, especially going forward, is that I always knew that showing like my tigers content or my cabrera stuff that a lot of times people weren't necessarily as interested in the cards as they were for what the cards meant to me or for what they could take away from the video for themselves so in terms of the former you know just what does that passion how does that translate to them if it was something that maybe they picked up for a set registry they were doing or something that they uh, if they're a player collector themselves, a, a similar car that they would pick up for their collections, what would that mean to them? And kind of being able to relate on that ethos level. Um, if you look at the big picture of things, uh, I wanted it to be a knowledge-based thing. So why did I make certain decisions? Why did I go after this? And that's kind of become... I guess now the aim of my card show recaps, that's why they're so long-winded, is that they're not necessarily about the cards. It's more so about the reasons and the interactions and just being able to share my experiences and hoping that people can kind of, I guess, live vicariously through me if they don't have the luxury of going to shows or that there just isn't any shows in their area. 
uh, or just perhaps them, you know, learning the reasons why I do things the way I do. Not necessarily if they want to become dealers or flippers or whatever the case is for themselves, but to be able to make better informed decisions regarding uh, buying for their own collection or selling for that matter, if that is a route that they choose to go down. That's really the aim of my podcast too, is to to really stop and make us think and, and challenge our belief systems as well. The hobby is something that doesn't really change too much. And a lot of times we can use to be being set in our ways and change as scary as it can be in certain circumstances, it is a, a necessary evil or even something that we should embrace because change is what leads to character growth and development. Um, having worn many different hats on my channel, it's definitely been interesting. You know, some people have come and gone along the way because they just aren't interested in what I'm putting out anymore. And that's perfectly okay. Um, I understand that it's, I'm not going to produce the content that everyone likes and enjoys, but I'm very happy with how things are right now in terms of where my business is at and how YouTube is going. Uh, there's definitely been many challenges along the way. I'm still facing some challenges now. This past week was a bit rough to say the least, but uh, just the perseverance, being able to continue and move forward um, and kind of share my journey through this platform. So at this point, uh, my platform, I would say here on YouTube, is to be able to influence others in a positive way and also be influenced by others in a positive way to learn from them and to use that to develop not only my business but also develop myself as a person because there's a lot of hidden curriculum that i think goes on it that sounds very deep and uh, existential for largely grown men talking about pictures of grown men on pieces of cardboard um, when you want to if you want to simplify it like that uh, but it is true there is there is a bit of a hidden curriculum and i think a lot that you can learn uh just from the way that people approach things so there you go mike i made you sit through 30 minutes of me going through my uh my life story on youtube so to speak but that is what uh youtube means to me and and the community as a whole i didn't really wrap that part up too well but the community as a whole is just being a part of something that's larger to yourself, right? We we like to feel that as human beings. And I think that's why we have, you know, there's, there's groups and cliques and communities to begin with is because it is, it gives us a sense of belonging. Um, so that's what it means to me is being able to be a part of something that I really enjoy that is bigger than just me. Um, and I can connect with like-minded people who have become some of my best friends, if not my best friends out there. Uh, people who I talk to daily, people who I feel that I could tell anything to, well, almost anything, you know, we, we don't get too personal with certain things, but people who uh, who know me is more than just Triple Crown 24. They know me for the person behind the screen name and the, the avatar that you see there. So um, that's what the community means to me. And there's there's just been so many influences out there, even there's probably people out there who have influenced me and I don't even think about it. It's been at a subconscious level. So now I will actually wrap it up this time. So thank you, Mike, for uh, putting on this contest, man. If I do win, you can bet your ass that I'll be down there in September for that Dallas show. So fingers crossed. <laughs> just, just playing around. But thank you, uh, anyone who stuck around and listened to me all, all this time. Again, I didn't mean to exclude anyone from my names that I mentioned. I was just kind of telling a story. I'm doing this in one take here. So this is definitely off the cuff. But uh, yeah, that's going to wrap it up for me. So until next time, take care, stay safe, be kind.